Thank you. Well, welcome. Thank um, you. And thank you for agreeing to this interview for um, thought leaders for IISD and for the, the um, uh, Trust for Sustainable Living in the UK. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so I've got a few questions for you. Uh, first of all, I thought we could start by talking about the idea of ecological footprinting and how that came about in the early days. The reason I started just after the Brompton report, we were very excited about sustainability entering the world stage and then with the Brompton Commission and then the Rio conference. But we were also concerned that the key issue didn't really seem to take front stage, which is that there's only one planet. Sustainable development, we believe, is the most specific policy concept around because development is a commitment to good lives, good lives for everybody. Sustainable and not accelerated development. We want sustainable development because there's only one planet. So how can we have great lives within the confines of one planet? That's the more specific way of looking at it. And for that we need tools, tools to measure how many planets we have, that's the easy answer. How many do we use? Uh, that's where the ecological footprint comes in. Thank you. Um, now there are a number of, of, tool, of, of terms that get bandied about. Ecological footprint, appropriated carrying capacity, mm -hmm overshoot mm -hmm. and then the one planet living. Can you tell me a little bit how they are linked or are they in fact the same concept? Everything is very much linked. I mean the one planet living, the idea is uh, promoted very much by our friends at Bioregional and WWF. Uh, that in the end there is only one planet and we want to live well. So that if they had three words rather than two, I would rather than saying sustainable development, I would say one planet living. You know, it's the living, you want to have a great life, and there's only one planet, so it becomes more specific, more easy to understand. At, now least, you need, it, at least it locates it to this planet, basically. It locates it to this planet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so uh, what, what the ecological footprint does, and originally we called it appropriate carrying capacity, it sounds a bit more academic, but in the end, the idea is very simple. It's a, it's a very simple research question, or a set of two questions. How much nature do we have? That's the biocapacity side. How much nature do we use? That's the footprint side. It's like with money, we want to know how much do we earn, how much do we spend. And the difference is the overshoot, is that right? At the global level, the difference is the overshoot. At the national level, we can use more than what is available within the ecosystems, within the boundaries of the nations, of the region, where we are, through a number of ways. One is overshoot, so that which means overusing ecosystems, beyond the regenerative capacity and the other two possibilities for sub global entities is to either net import biocapacity so to import more than you export in terms of biocapacity and and also use the global commons like for example as we emit co2 uh, that's and there's no capacity that we buy somewhere else to take care of it we basically give a wonderful gift to humanity of co2 concentration in the atmosphere so over 15 years uh, from the time when the idea really was a very new idea, uh, how has it changed? How has, how, what have you observed of the influence of the idea over these years? Yeah, there has been a very rapid uptake. And that's why in 2003 we decided we need to have our own organization that helps, a bit like IPCC, to be kind of the common ground for people interested in these topics and then to develop a common methodology so we can start to compare results. That's 2003, is already seven years ago. By 2005, we had the audacious idea of saying, we need to have nations to adopt the footprint like they now have GDP. And we set ourselves a goal to have 10 nations to adopt the footprint by 2015. We thought that would be impossible. Now we are already five years into the program and uh, we, have, we think we will exceed the goal. Uh, we have had various research collaborations with countries, that's how we start. First we say, nations, this is your risk, you need to understand whether these numbers are correct before you interpret the results. Just are these numbers consistent with your numbers? And then once that's established, then you can go into the interpretation phase. Switzerland now is the first country that is publishing our ecological footprint numbers in their statistical reports. We're working very closely with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we've also started a research collaboration with Ecuador where they already, before they even started research collaboration, said as a national policy goal, we need to move out of our ecological deficit. Why? Fifty years ago, they had about five times more biocapacity than footprint. So five times more ecological productive space, including fisheries and forests and cropland, than what it took to support the average resident in Ecuador. Now, they may be one of the first, or the first 
country in South America running an ecological deficit. So in a very short period of time, it shrank. Is that due to oil, or what is that due to? They increased their per capita consumption slightly. There are many more people, so there's less buy capacity per person. And Ecuador as a whole hasn't grown that much. So overall, that led to kind of the, the shrinkage from both sides. When we showed these numbers to high-level policy analysts, they said, are you against development rights? And we said, not at all. That's why we started as Global Footprint Network. We believe in the right to develop. But we asked them, why are you pursuing the right to collapse? So they were a bit shocked. <laughs> but yeah, that may, may not be the best uh, way forward. And so they start to see eliminating ecological deficit in a time of overshoot as core to their national self-interest. They decided this goal before Copenhagen even happened. According to Copenhagen, they wouldn't have had to move. But they started to recognize Copenhagen is not in our self-interest. We need to move much beyond that. And that's our belief. If nations truly think about their self-interest, most of them would come up with much more radical reduction targets than any Copenhagen dream would have generated. And that's for us the biggest puzzle that we're working on. We're not on a Sisyphus track, you know, pushing up the boulder in an impossible passage we think it's the right thing to do. No one come to contrary. We see these enormous golden opportunities for nations. If nations truly start to reflect about what's in their self-interest as a nation, in a word of overshoot, it becomes evident that nations and cities that are not ready for a resource-constrained future will bear the consequences. For example, I was in Israel and, and senior policy people then asked me, why should we in Israel, as a small country, worry about resource constraints when India and China are going through the roof? And the answer is very obvious. Even though China is very worried about these resource constraints, they may still go more through the roof than they already are. In such a world, if Israel, using 10 times more resources than their own country can regenerate, is not ready, Israel is toast. So think about yourself. That's the message we're bringing to the world. So if not thinking about others, think about your own self-interest. Absolutely. So yes, obviously, for humanity as a whole, there's a self-interest to preserve, and, but there's nobody representing humanity as a whole. For me as an individual, the self-interest is very weak on a number of levels. I mean, having a large footprint may be objectionable kind of morally or, or may, may hurt my soul, but it's quite comfortable to be in a well-heated or well-cooled house or to, you know, to have good clothes and to have healthy food. It's wonderful as an individual. And if Oakland, where I live now, turns sour, I pack my bags and go somewhere else. So but at the individual level, the self-interest is not that clear. But at the collective level, for Oakland, for example, Oakland cannot move. It may change its name, but it's still there. So if the Oakland infrastructure is not ad adjusted for the future, Oakland will suffer. So what Apollo 13 really meant, you know, when they were beaming back their message to Houston, they said, Houston, you have a problem. And Houston hasn't heard that. And they haven't moved much since they received the message back in the 70s. They're still so sprawled that just the infrastructure is trapping them. As a mayor of Houston, I would sleep very, very, very poorly. And that's why we are holding the conference here close to Siena, in an Italian setting, where the medieval towns are just built without the car and, and so much more efficient that without giving people lessons about environmental constraints or whatever, they just live a lifestyle, a happy lifestyle, using about threefold less resources than it would take in Houston. So the way we build our infrastructure is significant and has huge opportunities to increase our well-being while reducing our resource dependency quite massively. Another area that has huge golden opportunities we're not investing in is the demographic shift. We can very efficiently invest in demographic transition that improves the possibility of these populations, I mean just tremendously for all populations. In a world of resource constraints, shrinking, slowly shrinking populations have the highest competitive advantage. And that's what we haven't understood yet.